Hey everybody, welcome back. This is part two of our Coffee Coaster project. I'm Jake here at Langmer Systems, and today we're going to be hopping into basically the cam side of things, and then we're going to be taking our cam and making a program from it, and then taking our program and putting it onto the machine ready to cut our part out. Now, if you haven't seen part one, it's a great video where we explain our CAD side of things and the design, and it kind of helps introduce you to Fusion a little bit so you can get a little bit more familiar with it. But in this video, we're actually going to be taking our program and we're going to be taking it to the machine and basically giving you a rundown about some of the basics of machining and some of what you want to kind of look out for, tips and tricks, that sort of thing. Uh, we're going to be running the back side of our part today and basically getting half of our part finished and then we can take a look at it. So let's jump into it. So here we are in Fusion, in our cam side of things, and what we got here is we got our part loaded in, we in our manufacturer tab, I'm ready to go. So the first thing we want to start with is our stock. Let me just highlight that here. And so stock is basically the material that we're going to be starting with, whether that's aluminum or steel or plastic, whatever you're going to be cutting. And this is basically shown as this highlighted box around our part. Now what I've done is I've left ourselves a nice amount of room around the outside so that way when we go to cut this material it's going to be pretty much exactly how we want it to be you know with your stock your stock might not always be perfectly flat or perfectly straight and so you want to leave some extra material that way when you're cutting your part it's going to come out exactly what you want it to so let me open up see if we can show you more of what I'm talking about here uh, so we'll go over to our stock tab and what I've done is I've got a relative size on, I've got an add stock mode, and what I've done is I've just added a quarter inch of stock to the outside of the part, 50,000 stock to the top, and 200 thou on the bottom. And basically what's that, what's that done is we have a four and a half by four and a half size part, so that's going to make our stock five, and a half, five by five. And you'll notice that we've left a lot of stock at the bottom. Now why is that? That is because our jaws and our vise, when we're machining, it needs something to grip, something to hold on to. So that way when we're machining, it's not going to throw the part out of the machine. And we're going to have something really solid, really something really steady to hold on to as we're machining. And so if you can imagine, just kind of draw a line across in your mind's eye of where that jaw is going to be. And make sure we have enough room for our tool to come down and to clear it. And so here you can see 5 by 5 by 5 eighths. Perfect. So I come back. And what we're going to do here is for our first operation, I call it backside. The first operation, we're actually going to flip the part. And this is going to be our first operation. That way, if we come down and look at it, it's sitting in our vise with enough material to grab onto and we can work cleanly with our material. Here I'll show again. We got about 50 thousandths worth of material to clean up. And that's nice just in case there's a little bit of warp in our stock or if it's not perfectly straight. That way we got plenty of material to kind of help clean that up. And so that's stock. Uh, next thing is we're gonna start with our first operation. And for me, that's our facing operation. This is gonna take care of all the extra material that we have on the top. So let me show you real quick here just in our simulate of what that facing operation looks like just in case you are new to machining and you don't quite know what I'm talking about here. So there you go, you're just zipping that top layer off. And what we're going to do here is I'm going to jump into the nitty gritty, all the details and just kind of briefly explain why I set it up the way it is and like why you might want to change that at certain benefits. And so the first things first, we click on, let me let me take you a step back real quick, I'm a little ahead of myself. First thing I did here is I picked this face operation up in our 2D section. So I picked the face, this brought this up, and here's our window that we start with. So the first thing first is we can choose what tool we want to actually cut this face off with. And so I come up here to select tool. And this is Fusion's basically their tool catalog. This is kind of like a lot of their sample tools that are really easy to find. 
But for this job, we're going to be using two tools that we sell actually here at Langmere, which are pretty universal. You can use them for a lot of different things, a lot of really simple parts. But this is going to be our 3 8 flat end mill and our quarter inch 90 degree spot drill. This is basically, this 3 8 is going to do pretty much all the work on this part. It's going to be cutting out almost all of our material and then our spot drill is going to be for a little bit of engraving and chamfer cutting. That'll be really nice. And so I will select my 3 8 flat end mill as our tool. We've got flood coolant air as our option. And basically what these speeds and feeds are is how your tool is how your tool is going to be cutting this material and how fast it's going to go. And the way we determine that is basically through a simple formula that we have here that determines how much work your tool is going to be doing and how much pressure is going to be put on both your part and your tool. And so the first thing we want to start off with here, we look over here, is our spindle speed. And now we've ran this tool plenty of times before here at Langmere. We're going through aluminum and this is a coated carbide end mill we're going to be using. And so pretty much spindle speed is going to be actually the maximum MR1 it can run. It's just 8,000. And that's going to be plenty good for what we want to do. Surface speed here. Fusion is automatically going to update for us, so we don't have to worry about that. Ramp spindle speed is going to be the same. It's going to be our maximum. And now for our cutting feed rate. And the way we determine feed rate here at Langmuir is actually using something called MRR. And what MRR is, is material removal rate. This is a good kind of benchmark that you can set yourself when you're machining. And it's pretty, a pretty easy formula and a good way to know how much material, how much pressure you're going to be putting on the tool and on your part. And so what you start off with is you start off with your depth of cut times your width of cut times your feed rate. And that equals your MRR. And so what we're going to do here is we're actually going to work backwards. We're going to say we want an MRR of 3, which is, is pretty good, but also pretty relaxed. And what we're going to do is we're going to take that 3, and then we're going to take our depth of cut, which is going to be 45 thou, because we're going to leave about 5 thou material on the bottom, just for our, our finish pass and our little cleanup cut. And then we're going to take that times our width of cut, which is going to be 0.356 which is because we're going to use most of this tool when we're coming across and facing. That's going to help speed things up. And what we're going to try to figure out is our, our feed rate. And so we're going to put it into our formula. We're going to rearrange it so that way we get our feed rate. And after we run through all the numbers, we get our feed rate at the end. And so that ends up being way higher than actually what our maximum feed rate for, MR, for MR1 is going to be. And so we'll just put in 100 that's going to be our maximum of our machine. Fusion then automatically updates a feed per tooth. And so that's easy. Great. We don't have to use our brain for that. Lead in feed rate is going to be 80% of cutting. And so 80 lead out, same thing, 80. And our ramp is going to be half of cutting. So that's going to be 50, 50 feet per revolution automatically gets updated by fusion. So great. More brain power to save on our end. And that's our first screen. Now this may have sounded like a lot when we're first getting this figured out, but this is going to be this is going to kind of become second nature as we start filling in these some of these numbers, and a lot of these are going to be repeated in similar operations later on, so we're not going to have to change much. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to come over to our geometry. This is pretty much just automatically filled in by Fusion. You know, it's we told it that we wanted to face off the stock down to the top of our part just by clicking on this command. And so Fusion just goes, great, I know what you're doing. I already got it figured out. And what I like to do is I just kind of like to make sure that Fusion knows like what I'm talking about here. So it goes, yep, this is the top of the stock, that's the top of the part. Great. Then we'll jump to heights. Heights is pretty much where this confirms all of the different heights it's gonna be set into. So when the tool comes up to clearance, It'll be 600 thou above the part. When it starts feeding, it'll be 200 thou, and so on and so on. And so another thing I like to do is just, just again, to make sure that it, I know it's coming down to here, down to the top of my part. Just to make sure it's doing the right thing, just for my peace of mind. Uh, next, we're gonna come over to passes. And what passes are is basically just the, kind of the path this tool is going to be following when it is cutting. 
and how many passes it's going to take. And so pretty much the only thing I've really done here, uh, all this was automatically filled in by Fusion. The only thing I've done here is I've changed our step over amount. And you'll recognize that step over amount is our width of cut earlier. That's going to be using most of our tool here. And then the other option I've done here is stock to leave. That's going to be that five thou I talked about leaving for our finish and our cut up pass. Finish, cleanup, pass. There we go. And so that'll be for finishing, stock to leave. Next thing is linking. Now, I don't really touch linking very much. Linking is, I mean, you can do a lot with that, but that's for another video, for another time. Um, but I've just left linking exactly how it's supposed to be. So then I hit OK. Fusion generates my toolpath. And there it is. You can take a quick peek here just to make sure it's coming down in the right spot. And that way the lines are going to be doing what I expect them to do. And that's our first operation. Now what I did since then is I've kind of cheated a little bit. I like cheating is nice, saves time, saves energy. So I like to do one again. So I just came up here to this face operation and actually you can, so I right click and come down to copy. And then if I right click my backside and go to paste, it will paste all that same operation down at the bottom. And I can right and I can double click it. It has all of my custom parameters that I put in here. It does the same geometry, same height, same passes, everything exactly the same. And that's huge so that way I don't make a mistake when entering numbers or I, I don't forget something. And what I can do is I can just drag this up under my first operation where I want it. And then I can come in and I can slow things down. And so things are going to look prettier, things are going to look nicer if we slow down our feed rate. So what I'm going to do is I'll just change this to 20 and it'll automatically update our feed per tooth. I'm going to change all of our lead in and similar to that. I'll also change those to 20 just to slow things down, keep things looking nice. Okay, so all our feed rates are down, our spindle speeds are still the same, and all our geometry heights, all that's going to be the same. What I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off stock to leave. That way it's going to cut right down to where I want it. So now I'm going to give that a quick little preview in our simulate. And it'll zip right across, clean up that five thou we left. And now we're actually to size and we're to height. Now we have a nice flat surface that we can work off the top of our part. And now that we've had a chance to dive in a little bit and get our feet wet on the cam side, what we're gonna do is we're gonna hop over and we're gonna show the machine as it runs what we've just got done talking about. So we'll see the computer and we'll see all the bits and pieces behind it. And then we'll actually see what it looks like as it's cutting, as chips are flying. Uh, before we get to all of that though, what we're going to do is we're going to show the machine being set up and actually setting our part in the vice jaws. So that way we kind of get a feel for what it's going to look like if you were to set this up at home. Maybe you'll pick up a couple tips and tricks. Who knows? Hello everybody. Welcome back. Here we are at MR1, actually at the machine, ready to start cutting. It's about time. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to take up my piece of material and I'm going to take a look at it. So when you're looking at your material here, there's going to be the saw cut side, which is going to be the machine side of it, and then there's going to be our extruded side. Our extruded side comes directly from the manufacturer. This is going to be pretty darn close to what dimensions you want it to be. Uh, like this is five inches wide, pretty much exactly, and five eighths thick. And that's going to be very different from our saw cut side. See, so our saw cut side is a little more rough here. It's not going to be as perfectly straight since the saw is not going to cut perfectly straight. But that's all right. So what we're going to do is when we put it in our vise here, we're going to make sure our extruded side is facing the vise. That way, when we set it in, it's going to be nice and square. If, by chance, we were to set it in on the saw side, it might not be perfectly straight. Like, I, this is an exaggeration and everything's tight in here but there's going to be a little bit of a wiggle here because it's not going to be perfectly square. So that's always one thing to keep in mind is that we want to use the extruded side. Another good trick to use is you want to keep track of which side we put in the vise. So if we were to put this side 
up against our solid jaw back here. This is the solid jaw. This is the movable jaw because it moves and this one doesn't. So we put it up against our solid jaw. When we go to flip it, we're going to make sure the same side is facing that way for when we put it back in. That means that it's going to be a little bit more square, a little bit more accurate when we go to flip our part. So as I'm also feeling this piece of material here, what I'm doing is I'm feeling along the edges. And one thing I'll notice if I take my fingernail to it, if you can actually hear that, there's a burr that I saw kicked up, and that's not good. See, it's not going to matter much for this part, because what we're going to be doing is we're going to be clamping on the extruded side, which is nice and round. But if we were to load this in our jaw, in our vise, on that burr, it wouldn't sit perfectly flat, because it's got a little edge, a little sharp edge poking up here. And you always want to be careful uh, when you're running your fingers along this. I'm never running them this way, because that's a sharp edge. That can cut your finger, that can get you pretty good. So what I'm doing when I'm feeling for this burr is I'm coming across it like this, not along it. I'm kind of using my fingernail to find for it. Now there's a couple of different ways you can take off a burr on a part. Uh, you know, if you got a nice uh, belt sander set up, that's a perfect way to do it. You just kind of take it to the belt sander and roll it along to knock off that burr. That's great. I like to use a file, just kind of come across it. Ooh, that makes a good sound, doesn't it? What you do is you can just kind of roll that burr over with the file until you get it nice and smooth down. So now we have our part in the vise. We're pushing down on it. Oh, nice thing to mention too, this vise is an SMW vise. This is something that fits really well in the MR1 here. We like to use it here at Lagmere. And it's very easy to use, very simple to set up. Again, SMW, very nice jaw to use. So I have my material in here, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to press down on it, and I'm going to get my wrench and tighten it down. So I've got my wrench. I'm pressing kind of firmly down on it. Now what I've done is I've kind of adjusted the kind of in the general area of what I want, my course adjustment, and now I'm going to adjust it in the fine. So I'm just going to kind of hold with my left hand firmly, tighten down on one side, get the next part in, all while still holding firm, getting it nice and tight. That way, when we're cutting, our part's not going to go anywhere. Now, one nice little trick that we can use here is we can actually check our heights of our part and just double check that with our program we're not going to be running into our jaws. So I'm going to grab my calipers real quick. Here we are with digital calipers. What I'm going to do is the top of our part is going to be our zero height for our machine. Now what that means is that this very top of the machine on down is where our tool is going to go. So I know my tool in our program is going to come down about 420 thousandths. So what I just want to do is I want to grab a measurement off the top part and just measure that nothing's going to run into anything. So let me grab my quick measurement. Doesn't have, <coughs> doesn't have to be super accurate. We just kind of want to get an approximation. I'm getting about 473, so 473 to 480, and I know my part, my tool, is going to be coming down about 420. So that means I got about 50 or 60 thousandths worth of clearance, which is pretty comfortable in my book. I mean, you don't have to have a whole lot. Um, you know, you always want to make sure that you have enough gripping down here in the vise, but you also don't want to have too little because then you're getting really close to the top of your jaw and just in case something flexes kind of weird or something bucks up you want to make sure you got I don't know, at least 20 thou clearance between the top of your tool or the bottom of your tool and the top of your vise. Now it's always kind of when you're putting your vise and when you're putting your stock in here it's always kind of a balancing act between how much you want sticking up and how much you want down in the jaws. 
You always want to have a lot in the jaws so that way everything's nice and rigid and you know that you're going to be holding onto this part really well and that way you can take a bigger cut. But you also want enough sticking out that you can actually do what you want to do and be able to do it in a single operation. That's always the balancing act when it comes to machining. Uh, now, usually kind of rule of thumb, if you're not doing anything crazy or if you got plenty of material, which is why I chose 5 8 um, I have the sticking down about an eighth of an inch down with these jaws. And so we got a good enough material to hold on to uh, without having to do two operations or more. I like to err on the side of caution usually with stuff like this, especially if we're not doing anything too fancy if we're not doing any industrial operations. So just kind of stick it down in those jaws farther and hold on to things. So we got our material loaded in here. Everything's nice and square. It's been deburred. We tightened our jaw while we're holding down on the piece so everything's nice and flat. It's sitting squarely in here. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put my tool in. So the first tool we've got, you know, through our program, through our material, is this 3 8 end mill. You remember when we were setting this up on cam. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I got my 3 8 call it loaded in here. Everything's ready to go. What I'm going to do is I'm going to load this in to about right there. You can see that. Pretty much where the silver part meets this slightly golden bronzing part. And that's because I want to hold on to as much of this tool as possible. For the same reason I want to hold on to as much of this material as possible, the more of this tool that I can grab, that this collet can grab, is going to make it more sturdy, and it's going to make it flex less, and it's going to make it more accurate. Those are all very important things, because I know I'm not going to have to go way up on this tool here. You know, it only has about an inch worth of cutting fluid anyway. And so I want to make sure I'm holding on to as much of this tool as possible. So let me just loosen up the collet. I got handy dandy wrenches here for holding on to everything. Now let's go ahead and slide this in and we'll catch back up. There you have it. Tool ready. Everything's clear of the machine. Our stock's in there. We're ready to take a look on to the next part. We're back. We got our tool loaded. We got our part loaded. Now the next thing we need to do is we need to tell the machine where our part is in the space and that is our work coordinate system. Now, if you remember on our cam side of things, we told our work coordinate system it was going to be back here in the back left corner. So we need to tell the machine it's in the back left corner. And to do that, we're going to start off one by one. We're going to do the top side. We're going to touch off on the side. And we're going to touch off on the front. And in order to know where in X, Y, and Z it is, there's a pretty, it's pretty simple, pretty low tech way of knowing, but we're just going to use our hand. And so, in order to kind of figure out where each direction is, uh, we always know that Y is going to be perpendicular to our jaws. And so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to point out Y. And if we keep our hand up like this, and we point in our Y direction, and we also know that X is going to be that way. We take our middle finger, so that way we know Y is this way, X is that way, and our thumb is the last part, which is Z. Thumb goes up. So we have our Y positive pointing towards the jaw. We have our X positive pointing to the right. And we have our Z going straight up. Just a nice kind of easy way to remember which way is positive, which way is X, and which way is Y, all that good stuff. So let's start off with Z. And what we're going to do is we're going to take that tool and we're going to come down and we're going to touch off the top of this part. We're going to use a very high-tech piece of equipment for that. We're going to use a standard piece of paper. And what that tool is going to do is it's going to come down on the top of this paper that is three, about three thousandths thick. And we're going to touch off the top of the paper so that way we don't scratch up our part. And then we're going to tell the machine, hey, you're three thousandths above your work coordinate system. And that's how we touch off the top. So let's go ahead and show that now. I'm going to grab our remote control here. and I'm going to manually jog our machine into place. And I'm going to shoot towards the middle of our part here, 
just to make sure that that's about the average spot of the entire part, because if you remember, not everything is perfectly flat. We have to keep in mind that this is a little different from the computer. In the computer, everything's nice and perfect, exactly how we want it. In the real world, the materials are going to have little bits of differences to them, so we're going to kind of aim for the average part. So I'm going to go ahead and bring it down now, kind of close. Once I get close, I'm going to bring things way down here. So I'm reaching over here on our cut control system, and I'm just going to kind of slow things down. And I'm going to bring in the step, just step it about 10 thou at a time. I'm just going to get it nice and close to the top of the part. Alright, to about there. And then we're going to start walking it down 1 thou at a time. So I've got my high tech piece of paper. What I'm going to do is I'm going to just get it in there. I'm just going to slide it back and forth, just so I know that when it gets to the top of the part, I'm going to start feeling the tool catch this paper, and I'm going to know that that's when it's hitting the top. This is kind of just something you get used to, something the more you practice with, the better you get at. So right now, see I can't move this paper, that's too far down, so I'm going to bring it one step up, and that's about right. So if I slide my paper out, and then over here on the DRO, I'm going to tell it, hey, we are three thousandths above where we want to be. Done. So that's our Z. Now I'm going to put it back into continuous, and we're going to nicely come up, not down. Voila. All right, next we're going to do the side. So I'm going to jog over to the side. Make sure I'm well clear before I come down. And it doesn't have to be too far down, just enough to where we know we're going to be making contact. We're also going to be in the center of our part there. That way we're getting the average, because it's again, this is the saw cut side, so it's going to be a little different. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on, once everything I know is all clear, is I'm going to turn on our spindle so we can take a nice little cut. So I'm coming over here to cut control, spindle on, bump it up to about 4,000 is a nice good cutting range. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to touch off the side, the side of this part real slow, and then we're going to move our DRO over. So I've touched off just on the side of it, and I know this is a 3 8 tool. So I know to get to the center of our tool, that's where we want to tell the machine, hey, this is our work coordinate. So I want to do a little bit of math here. I know I have a 3 8 tool, that's 375. And I need to tell the machine, you are half of that over, which is 0 0.1875. So I'm going to come over to my X direction. Remember, this is going to be our X side. I'm going to tell it negative 0.1875. So now the machine knows where it's at. So next thing, that was our side. We've done our top. Now we're going to do our front side. So again, carefully, I'm going to just kind of take it slow and make sure I'm going the right direction. Excellent. And it's never, you can never be too safe. You can never be too sure about where you're at and where you're going. Go ahead and just, you know what, double check you're going the right direction. Double check that you're not going to slam into something as you're moving this along. There's nothing wrong with that. And even if it helps you, you can come around to the side of your machine 
get a better look at where you're at. Okay. It's going to get a little, you're going to have to turn your controller to make sure you're going the right direction. But this helps you get a much better look to see, to make sure you're not going to be hitting anything, running into anything. And we're going to do the same thing as we did on the side of the part, just on the front. So I'm going to come over here to our controller. And I'm going to slow things down just ahead of time, since we're going to be on the other side of our machine. I'm going to start up our spindle, like so. I step it down to one thou at a time until we touch off. And we're going to bring it up. And turn our spindle off. And now, same thing on the side of the part. We're going to tell the machine that it needs to come down another 0.1875, since that's half our tool. So I'm going to type in y negative 0.1875. Oh, look at that. I've goofed already. We are at the top of our part. So I need to tell this part, no, we're actually positive y. See, I need to hold up my fingers now just to make sure I'm going in the right direction. So I'm going to come back, positive 0.1875, since we are in the positive direction of our part. And now, after we've done that, we can kind of double check that, you know what, let's make sure our coordinate system is exactly where we want it to be. So I'm going to come over here on our cut control and I type in go to zero coordinate. And the machine's going to zip on over to where we want it to be. Now, I can come down and I can look and I can see that my tool is right in line to where I want it to be. Yep, on both sides. So that's how we touch off our part, doing it the old fashioned way. Now, this is just the very basic, very simple way to touch off your part. Of course, we are going to offer probes and probing cycles, so that way it's going to be much easier to use, much faster. But this is, again, just kind of a basic video, just kind of showing what you can do with the machine and how you might go about setting off a work coordinate. Uh, another thing to keep in mind here as we're going along is that these jaws they're already set in here. We've already got them in. We have them indicated in, so that way they're perfectly straight and perfectly in. That's going to be something you're going to have to do by yourself uh, when you set up your machine, but that's going to be another video where we're going to help you and we're going to walk you through exactly how to do that. So now we have our machine set up. It's ready to go. It knows where our tool is at. It knows where our material is at. Next thing we need to do is we need to get a program in here start cutting. Now, if you remember where we left off in our cam, we were just about to start facing off our part. Basically, what we're going to do is we know we have about 50 thousandths worth to take off the top. So our first cut is going to come down and take off 45 thou off the top. And that's going to be our roughing cut, so we're really going to hog off chips. And then after that, we're going to come through with a finish pass that's only about 5 thousandths. And that, what that finish pass is going to do is it's going to give us a much better finish than that roughing cut would. Sure, it's a little slower, but you know what? We got time, and we really want to make this look pretty. So let's see what that looks like out on MR1.
So that's what I've done. I'll just get that out of here. That's what I've done with this one here. So there is our roughing and our finishing. Next thing after that is we start with our adaptive. And what adaptive does is very smart feature actually here in Fusion is you tell it, hey, here's my part. You know my stock already. What I need you to do is I need you to cut off all the material surrounding that part. That way we can get things done. And Fusion goes, okay, great, I'll do that. And it will automatically fill in the tool paths it needs to cut this part out. And so if we double click on this and take a look at it, I'll show you what I'm talking about. So just like before, we bring up our speeds and feeds table. Our tool is going to be the same. Our spindle speed is going to be the same. Pretty much everything's going to be the same here because we're going to change our width of cut. Now I'll kind of jump ahead a little bit to see, show you what I'm talking about. And we'll see our optimal load here is going to be our width of cut. So we're going to start off with 75 thou. So our formula then becomes our main goal we're shooting for for our MRR is still 3. We now have a 0 0.075 width of cut. And our depth of cut is going to be much larger. And so the kind of the, the strategy we're going for here is going to be a large depth of cut small width of cut, same feed rate. And that's gonna get us closer to our three number. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna plug all that in and it gives us pretty much the same thing, which is maxed out. <laughs> we're really gonna take advantage of our speed here and we're just going to rip through all this material around the outside. And so that's gonna be feed speeds. Now geometry, we pretty much told the same thing. Um, I have stock, tour, stock contour set on here, so that way it will cut out a uh, stock around the outside. And it takes a look at what I've told it already, and it goes, okay, we'll cut all that out for you. And so what I've done is I've adjusted the bottom height here. And so the Fusion already knows that I want it to cut down to the bottom of our part. And it's going to go around the outside of the perimeter to do that. But then what I've also told it is that it needs to come down 20 more thou on the bottom of our part. And that's just to make sure we get a good cleanup around the outside. And so that way we have a little bit more of a smooth transition from when we flip this part around and we mow off the top of it. And so that's all I've changed here on this bottom height. If we go up to passes. This is where we've typed in our optimal load of 75 thou. Basically all this stuff here is pretty much the same. I've left it as it should have been. We want to make sure that we're climb cutting, which climb cutting very simply is just the tool moving in the direction that the tool is also spinning. If you think about it, this tool is moving clockwise, and so it's going to be going around the part in a clockwise motion. That's basically climb cutting. The opposite of that is conventional cutting. And so the last option I've clicked on here is also stock to leave. And I've left about three thou on the outside of it, just so that way in our tool, it, it may not seem like it as it's going across, but as our tool goes across this material, it's flexing ever so slightly. 
I know it's, it's weird to think about, but metal flexes and metal shifts and deforms and it may not look like it, but it's there. And so what we're doing is we're leaving about three thou along the outside of it, just so when we come through with our finish, we can clean up real nice. And so all these other options are off. Our linking is pretty much how we left it. And I click OK. We'll give ourselves a brief view of what this is going to look like. And we'll also get a nice view of what this actually looks like on the machine, just for a comparison. So it's going to come around making those little bite-sized parts. And just clean up the outside of our part like we needed to. And here if I take it step backwards, you can see just how small that 75 thou is. And how big of a depth the cut we're taking, but how small our width of cut is. And it lets us just zip around the outside of that part. Now adaptive clearing, it's pretty smart about it. It will come up with the fastest way to get things done, even if you notice, after it's all done doing the perimeter, it picks itself up and comes down and does these corners individually. Now it may, it may seem a little counterintuitive, it may seem a little weird, but that's actually the fastest, most efficient way to do that. All right, so let's jump over to MR1 now and see those chips fly. That is our 2D adaptive, or excuse me, 3D adaptive. And that's up here under our 3D tab, adaptive clearing. So after we've had it chunk out all our material, we'll come back through here as a finish pass. Now this is a 2D contour. It's a little different than our 3D one we did earlier. And it's basically just a follow-up pass of what we've done and that'll help clean up all of our flex and clean up any of our material and this is actually going to be ran at our slower 20 thou feed rate and that's just to keep things nice and smooth and another thing we've done here if i go back you'll see us come in here with this red line and this is actually our starting point here and what we're doing is we're starting on this corner on this radius so that way when it starts, it doesn't leave as much of a line behind. If you'll notice, um, when we're actually running our part, if we were to start on a wall here, it would zip around, come back, and after it comes off, you would see just this hair-thin line, and you'll be able to tell where the tool started. 
If we start here on the radius, it'll be much, much harder to see. So what we did here is we come over to our linking tab. Here we're actually going to be using it. And when we come down here to position, we can actually pick our entry position. And so what I've done is I've just clicked this entry position here on the middle of our radius. And so that way it knows when the tool comes down, that's where it's going to be starting from. So we have our 2D contour coming along and finishing our wall of our material here. Then after that, we can give it a 2D pocket command. And what 2D pocket does is basically we just tell it we want the bottoms of these four pockets milled out and it'll come through and clean everything up. You'll see what I mean here in a second when we jump over to the machine. And that's the start of our first operation. I mean, that's all our tools that we need to cut up all this material. Now, the thing about Fusion is, is that the way it exports our tool program and our lines of code is we actually need to split it up when we're going to do tool changes. And so all this stuff is going to work great for our first operation. But then when we come through to do our 2D chamfer, and clean up the edges, we're going to need to post that in a separate post. And so just these tools are going to be our first operation and our 2D chamfer and we're going to break down into a new line of code. Now that we have our new program loaded, we can look at our 2D chamfer. And what 2D chamfer does is it pretty much just looks at the chamfer that we already have on our part and we'll basically make a toolpath for it, just like this. And so if we actually jump into our option here, we can notice that our spindle speed is still the same. It's going to be at 8,000 maximum RPM. Our cutting feed rate is down to 20 for our finish. Uh, lead in, lead out is 50, ramp is 50. We're not going to be doing really any ramping, but lead in, lead out, just 50 to kind of keep it moving along pretty quick. And the other thing we've done is we've also started it on the radius on the corner again, just because it's going to do the same thing. It's going to, when it comes in, It'll leave a line if we let it, and so we're going to come in at a radius just to keep it everything nice. And so if you look at geometry, it's a little different from our contours and our pockets. We have to tell it where it's going to be cutting, and so we actually select the top of our chamfer here. And then after that, Fusion's smart enough to know, okay, I need to cut the rest of it. So if we come to heights, we'll just double check that it knows where we're going to. So yep, that's the top of the part. I always like to check to make sure Fusion knows where it's at. We're not doing any multiple passes here, we're not leaving any material. This is just a simple 40 thou chamfer just to clean things up. And the linking, we won't touch. So there's our 2D chamfer. Now once more again, we'll finish up this side of things by watching the chamfer mill go around and make sure it gets a nice clean finish.
All right, so after all that, we got the first half of our part. Uh, pretty happy with the finish. It machined pretty easily, and uh, everything looks good, meshes good. So now all it's left to do is flip it around and deck off the other part and put the rest of the features on. We also got little rubber feet that we can put in those pockets and keep everything nice and secure and keep it from sliding and scratching things. So I'm pretty happy with the results all in all. And so if you guys like this video, feel free to leave a comment down below and leave a thumbs up if you liked it. And we'll be looking forward to seeing you in the next video.